Go ahead and grab your Bibles and turn uh, to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, uh, as we pick up where we left off last week, beginning at verse 9. Uh, this morning's message is entitled, Identifying Jesus. Identifying Jesus. And so the question uh, for today to, to ponder uh, in your own minds is, who is Jesus to you? All right? Who is Jesus to you? You see, uh, who we understand Jesus to be is critical. It is absolutely critical. If we do not know who he is and, and then we respond to him in an appropriate way, the consequences are both final and eternal. Final and eternal. Let that sink in for a moment. You see, the, the identity of Jesus has been under scrutiny since the day he was born. Right? That, that there's always been a question about who he is. Some would say that Jesus was just a carpenter's son, that some would say that he was just a good and devout man, that some would say that he was a good teacher, and that some would say that he was a, a good example or maybe was a, a good role model for us to follow. And then some would even go so far as to say that he was God in the flesh, that he was God in the flesh, that he was the Messiah, that he was the Savior of the world. So which answer is correct? Which answer is correct? You see, he was a carpenter's son but not just a carpenter's son. He was a good and devout man, but not just a good and devout man. He was a good teacher, but not just a a good teacher. He was a good example for us to follow, but he was more than just a good example for us to follow. You see, all of those are correct. All of those are correct, but incomplete. That Jesus is much more than those things. And as Christians, we have come to believe that through the revelation of the Word of God and the illumination of the Holy Spirit in our own lives, that Jesus is indeed the Son of God, that He is God in the flesh, that Jesus is the promised Messiah, that Jesus is the blessed Savior of the world. And you see this morning, Mark's Gospel will make that perfectly clear to us. If we're willing to open our eyes, open our minds, open our hearts to receive this truth, that our passage will give us three comforting ways to identify Jesus rightly so that we can rightly relate to Him as a response that we will see that Jesus is one of us. He is one of us. We'll see that Jesus is the Son of God, and we'll also see that Jesus is the adversary of Satan. He's the adversary of Satan. So go ahead and grab your Bibles if you have them, and stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word together. Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 13. It says, It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, and was baptized by John in the Jordan, and immediately coming up from the water, he saw heavens, the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beast, and the angels ministered to him. Father, we thank you for this day that you have given us. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. We ask that you would help us to understand this passage. Teach us your word. Father, help us to to, to know with clarity and with certainty who Jesus is. Father, help us to respond to that knowledge. We love you, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You see, if you were here last week or if you caught up on last week's sermon from our YouTube channel or whatever the case may be, uh, last week it was all about the proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ. We, we, we dealt with uh, John the Baptist and, and his, his call, his mission that we saw uh, that enormous crowds of, of Jews were coming out into the wilderness to be baptized uh, by John. And I think I may have failed to, to mention last week, but John the Baptist is indeed Jesus' cousin. Right? We know that as we read some of the other Gospels. And so uh, they were being baptized in the Jordan River, and, and we, we, we learned that John was the forerunner to Jesus. Right? He was, uh, his job was to prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah, and he was doing a, a bang-up job. And he was doing a, a wonderful work there. And, and, and uh, Bible theologians are, 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 uh, believe that as many as 300,000 had come out to, to, to see uh, and hear John the Baptist, and we're being baptized for the remission of their sins. That, that, that the wilderness uh, uh, was, was reminiscent, uh, as we learned last week, of Israel and their time of, of disobedience and their wandering 
uh, for a period of 40 years and after they were being freed by uh, God uh, from the Egyptian uh, bondage there. And, and, and this, this, this whole idea of going out to see John in the wilderness was, was surely uh, imagery that they would be able to relate to. And now we have Jesus who was uh, about to begin his mission of, of reconciliation. And, and John's message was simply to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. That's the whole uh, gist of what John was about. And now John was ready, uh, readying Israel for, for one that would come and baptize them in the, with the Holy Spirit. And so last week we, weren't, we, we learned about the means of the good news, right? The means of the good news, what we talked about last week. One of the points that God's Word and God's Spirit uh, and, and that salvation is God's work and that the gospel is the power to see people saved. That's the, the means of the good news. And then we also learned uh, that the, the message of the good news, right? And we talked about how it's a message of repentance and belief, to, to, to repent of your sins and believe that Jesus is indeed the Son of God. And then we also learned about the messenger of the good news, that we learned that, that every believer, every believer is a messenger of the gospel. Either you're an obedient messenger or you're a disobedient messenger, but we are all messengers of the gospel. That the Great Commission is all of our responsibility, not just pastors. Amen? All right. And so this week, uh, Mark's goal is to, is to give the readers of his gospel some clarity in identifying who Jesus really is. So the first way that Mark identifies Jesus is found for us in verse 9. Verse 9, Jesus is one of us. Jesus is one of us. It says that it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And see, if you're familiar with the other Gospels or, or have ever uh, heard the actual Christmas story, the, the, the le- legitimate Christmas story, not the one that uh, the, the, uh, the culture puts out there, uh, if you know the story of baby Jesus being uh, being born in a manger, you'll know that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords came to us in humility and lowliness. That's how we, we see Jesus coming on the scene, the, the birth of Count. Mark's Gospel doesn't have this. We have to learn this from the others. That though he was the Son of God, his earthly father was Joseph. Joseph, the, the carpenter of Nazareth. So what you have here is Jesus being born and, and being raised by a man, a, a working class man, from a working class town. Can anybody identify with that? A, a working class man from a working class town that Nazareth was a, a nowhere town in the region of Galilee. It had no respect. Nobody thought much of Nazareth whatsoever. It, it was a, a, an area that was uh, looked down upon uh, by the pure bloods there in Jerusalem because of its infestation of Gentiles. There was a high, high uh, density of Gentiles that lived there in the region of Galilee. And as Pastor Danny Aiken put it, Jesus was a nobody from nowhere. Jesus was a nobody from nowhere. I think that sums it up quite nicely. And so why would God send His one and only Son to be born in a nasty manger, to be raised by a carpenter in a nowhere town? Why would He do that? I think the, the answer is found in our text. So that Jesus could identify with you and with me so that He could identify with you and with me to show that He was one of us, that He was not given any advantage because of His divinity, that He lived out His days here on earth as a man, fully a man, that the Creator of humanity became a member of His own creation. John 1.14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as the one of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And the author of Hebrews uh, went on to, to write about how Jesus faced every temptation that is common to humanity. Everything that we face, He faced. Why? So that He could sympathize with us in our struggle with sin and temptation. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. All points tempted. All points Everything that we face, everything we deal with, guess what? So did Jesus. But He did it without sin. You see, Jesus experienced everything that we experience. Hunger, pain, sadness, frustration, joy, betrayal. He grew tired. He he required rest and He required sleep. He mourned the death of His friend Lazarus. He grew enraged at the money changers in the temple court. 
And then he would be betrayed by one of his own. One of his own disciples would be the one who would betray him. The, the, the leader of his group of disciples would even deny him, uh, no, uh, even knowing him three times. He knows. And you see, ultimately he would die just like we do. He would die just like we do, but not for the reason that we do. You see, we die because we're all sinners. That's why we die. Jesus died because he was without sin. You say, well, that's a strange statement. Why would he die because he's without sin? Because he took our place, that's why. He took our place. He died so that we could be reconciled back to God. He died, uh, he took our place so that all of our sins could be forgiven and we could be receive eternal life instead of eternal condemnation. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. See, this is what is known as substitutionary atonement. Substitutionary atonement. You see, only a sinless human could serve as a suitable sacrifice for sinful humans. It's uh, apples for apples, oranges for oranges. It had to be the exact same thing to be able to, to, to substitute that the animal sacrifices of bulls and goats uh, was nothing but a, a foreshadow. It was an example of the once and for all sacrifice of the sinless Son of God that would come. That Jesus was the fulfillment of the Lamb without blemish. The Lamb without blemish. The, the perfect Lamb of God that was given for our sake. You see, if, Je- if Jesus was sinless, then why did He need to be baptized? Sometimes you read this passage, I don't understand this. Why, why do we see Jesus being baptized? Because John was clear last week was they were coming to be baptized for the remission of sins, even confessing their sins. But we know that Jesus is without sin. So why? Why does He need to be baptized? So He could identify Himself with sinners. That's why. So He could identify Himself with sinners. So that He would identify Himself with those that He came to save. You see, He didn't repent of His sin because He was without sin. Right? We've already touched on that. You see, a, a pastor... Uh, R. Kent Hughes, uh, one of the, uh, the, uh, the, the men I use as a resource as I prepare this, but he said this. He says, because Jesus was sinless, he needed no baptism of repentance. But in his baptism, he associated himself with us sinners and placed himself among the guilty, not for his own salvation, but for ours, not for his guilt, but for ours, not because he feared the wrath to come, but to save us from it. That's why. That's why he was baptized. That Jesus was baptized to show that he was one of us. And you see, Jesus is still one of us in heaven. He's still one of us. He is still a flesh and blood man. A perfected and exalted man, but a man nonetheless. Get your mind around that. When we see Jesus face to face, you're going to see the face of a man. A flesh and blood man. And so what does this mean? What does this mean for you and me? How can we apply this truth this morning? You see, when you begin to, to be overwhelmed or if you begin to grow discouraged in whatever your circumstances are, you can know that, that, that God understands. When you begin to think that God, that God just can't possibly know what you're going through and that God possibly can't understand what you're feeling right now, remind yourself of this truth. Remind yourself of this truth that Jesus is one of us, that we do have a sympathetic and perfected and glorified human high priest in heaven that has experienced all that we have and much, much more, yet He done it without sin. Look to Him for your strength. Look to Him for your help. Look to Him for your encouragement and your rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight and 29. Come to Me, all, who, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take My yoke upon you and learn from Me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. See, Mark's Gospel identifies Jesus as one of us. What a comfort to know that. He is one of us. And the second way that Mark identifies Jesus is found in verses 10 and 11. Verses 10 and 11 says that Jesus is the Son of God. This is big. This is a big, big uh, revelation. In verse 10 and 11 says, And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You or my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. You see, here is the, the clearest examples of what is known as the Trinity. That's what we see here, or, or what Bible theologians call Trinitarian theology. Trinitarian theology. That, 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 that Trinitarian theology is a belief based off of 
the evidence of Scripture that God exists in three distinct persons and yet is still one God. Not three different gods, one God, three distinct persons. You see, Orthodox Christians believe that God exists simultaneously as God the Father, as God the Son, and God the Spirit. How does this work? We don't know. We don't know, but it's it's definitely what the Bible teaches us. We have one God, not three. That would be pluralism. And that would be a whole other issue. We do not worship multiple gods. We We worship one God. And so lots of people uh, think that the Trinity is is a hard concept to grasp, and and I would uh, wholeheartedly say, yes, it is, and I would agree, and most of you would agree the same. But that's because there's nothing else in existence that's like it. There's nothing else that compares to the uh, the Trinity, the the, the Godhead, this three-in-one thing. All the analogies that maybe you've heard in your lifetime are, are fall short, the whole the egg analogy, or maybe even the water analogy. All these uh, explanations or analogies fall terribly short of explaining the Trinity. Even the great Baptist preacher Adrian Rogers had this to say about the Trinity. Y'all know who Adrian Rogers is, right? Surely y'all know who Adrian Rogers is. He said this, The doctrine of the Trinity is not beyond logic and reason, just above it. Just above it. I think that's a great statement. It's above it. It's so hard to comprehend. You see, the main claim uh, that the Jews made against Jesus was that he was a blasphemer. That he was a blasphemer, that he he made uh, these false claims, they would say, to be the Son of God. That he even forgave sins. That was a big big deal for them. That's one of the main things they noticed, that uh, to forgive sins was something that only God can do. So to do that was definitely giving them ammunition to condemn him. You see, only a very small a group of people would actually believe that Jesus was truly the Son of God before His erection. And many still refuse to believe afterwards. And now it's been 2,000 years since His resurrection and ascension, and the vast majority of our planet will still not recognize Jesus as the Son of God. Of course, Jesus was not caught off guard by this. He was not uh, taken aback by this. He knew this would happen. You see, one of the perks of being the Son of God is that He knows all things. And so He knew that this would happen. And he, and he gave a, a, a foreshadow or, or he spoke of this or how few people would ever come to faith or would ever come to believe in him as a son of God. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, it says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. There are few who find it, is what the Word of God says, what Jesus' own words are to us. You see, belief in Jesus as the Son of God is a narrow gate. It's a narrow gate that nobody is saved apart from believing that Jesus is the Son of God. And so let's look to the Scriptures and let the Word of God give us the identity of Jesus. You see, as as soon as Jesus came up from the water, it says the, the, the heavens opened, they parted, and that the Spirit descended. And that the Father announced His pleasure in His Son. You see, the way it's worded in the text makes it seem as though only Jesus hears what's being said and done. Right? We're given a a, a privilege of knowing what what seeing what He sees and hearing what He sees. It's kind of like what happened when God met Saul on the road to Damascus. It's kind of a mystery that that only Saul knew what was going on. He saw that they they could see the light, but they knew did not know what was going on. It's a very similar situation here. Which makes sense, if you think about it. Because otherwise, uh, if everyone that was there uh, heard and saw what was being said, wouldn't you think a whole lot more people would have believed that Jesus was the Son of God? But if they would have heard and seen all those things and, and, give, and given witness to those things, more people would have been believing that He was the Son of God. And, and surely uh, everyone that was present would have believed. You see, this was God the Father affirming and assuring His Son as he begins his three-year journey to the cross. That's what's happening here. It's a commissioning. It's a commissioning that the Spirit of God descended like a dove, quietly and and gently empowering Jesus for the mission that lay ahead of him. You see, all this are are, are clearly uh, uh, fulfillments of multiple prophetic texts from our Old Testament. When he says, you are my son, uh, can be found in Psalm 2-7. Psalm 2-7 says, I will declare the decree... The Lord has said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. 
in calling Jesus my beloved son, we are reminded of how uh, Abraham looked at his son Isaac, the son of promise, who was to be a foreshadow of the true son of promise. In Genesis 22, verse 2, says, Then he said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. And then, in whom I am well pleased reminds us of Isaiah 42, 1, which is the first of Isaiah's suffering servant songs. Isaiah 42, 1 says, Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my elect one whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. That God the Father had never addressed anyone like this before. That God the Father had never addressed anyone like this uh, at any other time, that no prophet was ever called a son, that Abraham was God's friend but not his son, that Moses was his servant but not his son, that David was a man after his own heart but not his son. You see, Jesus and Jesus alone is the one and only beloved Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. And as if God's own declaration was not enough, the Scriptures record the miraculous things that Jesus, Jesus accomplished things that only the divine Son of God could possibly do. Though He forgave sins. He healed the sick and the afflicted. He cast out demons. He controlled the weather and raised the dead. Who could do that if you weren't the Son of God, if you weren't the second person of the Trinity? And ultimately, He would be resurrected Himself, defeating sin, death, and hell once and for all. You see, God the Father was well pleased with what He's seen. He was well pleased with His Son's willful obedience to humble himself as a man and endure the shame and the humiliation of the cross and ultimately suffer tremendously on that cross to redeem fallen humanity, to redeem you and me. And so, how does, you know, what does this mean for you and me? How can we apply this truth to our lives? You see, Jesus is the Son of God. That Jesus is God. Let that sink in. He is God Himself. And what do we do when we relate to God? We love Him. We love Jesus. We worship Jesus. We obey Jesus. We submit our lives completely to Jesus. That's how we respond. That He is the Alpha and He is the Omega. He is the beginning and He is the end. That He is the eternally pre-existent Son of the living God and there has never been a time when the Son of God did not exist. That Jesus is the incarnate Son of God, the God-man, fully God and fully man. Amen? And you ask one more question, you say, uh, Brother Mike, how does that work? How does that work? How can he be fully God and fully man? How can Jesus be both? You ready for this? I don't know. I don't know. And anybody who tells you they can, they can reconcile it and can explain it, they're, they're lying to you. They're misleading you. We don't know, but what we do know is that this is what the Bible teaches, and the Bible is the true and inerrant Word of God. And we believe it. And we accept it. Amen? All right, Mark's gospel identifies Jesus as the Son of God. And the third way that Mark identifies Jesus is found in verses 12 and 13. Jesus is the adversary of Satan. It says immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beast, and the angels ministered to him. You see, Jesus was not being harassed by Satan in the wilderness, Jesus was serving notice to Satan. He was serving notice to Satan that his reign was coming to an end, that the cross and victory were on the way. This was not Satan coming after Jesus. This was Jesus coming after Satan. Right? That Jesus was, was no victim here. Jesus was coming after the enemy. That, that Jesus was the adversary. That the Spirit of God drove Jesus out into the wilderness. This was an act of aggression on the part of the kingdom of heaven that the fuse had been lit and nothing was going to stop Jesus from fulfilling His divine purpose to redeem fallen humanity and crush Satan once and for all. That's what's going on here. You see, Mark's Gospel gives us very little details. It doesn't. If you want more details, you have to go to Matthew or or, or Luke's Gospel, another Gospel to find out more of what happened here in the wilderness. All we have is sketchy details. It tells us that uh, there was a period of 40 days, which is a a common number throughout the Bible for a period of trials or testing. We know that. that He it, it tells us uh, that this period of 40 days, we think about uh, the, how it rained for 40 days and 40 nights in the days of Noah, right? That's, we're familiar with that. 
uh, that, that we, we, we know that Israel wandered in the desert for 40 years because of their unbelief. We know that Moses spent 40 days on Mount Sinai. We, we know that. We know that Elijah spent 40 days on Mount Horeb. And now we have Jesus spending 40 days in the wilderness. 40 days in the wilderness fasting according to Matthew's Gospel and being tempted by Satan. You see, Satan attacked Jesus as he would any other man, which is strange. He attacked Jesus as, just like he would any other man. I, I guess you could say that even uh, Satan knew that Jesus was one of us. He knew that he was one of us, that he was uh, fully human, but he erred greatly by dismissing Jesus' deity as being a son of God. See, he, 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 he misstepped or he misspoken when he uh, discounted Jesus being the Son of God. You see, Jesus knew the tactic of Satan. He knew them. He knew them already, that he is a liar and a deceiver. He knew this. In John's Gospel, Jesus said this about him as he was being confronted by the religious leaders that wanted to kill him. In John 8.44, it says this. He says, You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer, talking about the devil, Satan. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Right? According, to the Matthews, according to Matthew's gospel, Satan was making offers and promises that he had no authority to make and no ability to keep. He had no authority to, to, to make and no ability to keep. His goal was to get Jesus to sin. That's it. Plain and simple. That was his goal, was to get Jesus to sin. If he could get Jesus to sin, guess what? He wins. He wins. Every, everything's over. Everything ceases. See, the only hope of redemption for humanity would have been gone forever if Jesus would have sinned. But you see, Jesus is both fully divine and fully human. He has a divine nature as well. He is fully God, which meant He was limited physically and He could suffer physical harm. We know that. We, we see that in the Scriptures. And, it, and it's noteworthy that, that Mark would mention the wild beast. That's not in the other Gospels, but Mark goes... Uh, to the to the uh, the makes a point to say that Jesus was with the wild beast in the wilderness, that these these fierce predators were working in unison, working with unison with Satan to cause injury and to strike fear into the heart and mind of Jesus. And just like well, that's kind of a peculiar statement. Why would he add something like this? The Romans would know. The Romans would think of these wild beasts and, and be reminded of what they had possibly seen in the Colosseums as 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 Christians were were were, were dressed in animal skins and thrown in the Colosseums, and their bodies would be ripped to pieces by fierce animals, by wild beasts. And so they would, they would be able to imagine what was going on, what Jesus was experiencing out in the wilderness. Think about it. You have Jesus here alone in, in the deep and desolate wilderness, that, that severe hunger is now overcoming him from the fasting, that he's being stalked and harassed by wild beasts. And then we have Satan appears and offers to make it all go away. Wow. Make it all go away. He'll do the same thing for you. If, if Jesus would only bow down and worship Him. If Jesus would only bow down and worship Him, all this would go away. You see, even though Jesus was limited physically because of His humanity, He never ceased to be the Son of God. He never ceased to be the Son of God, which is important because He never ceased to be holy. He never ceased to be holy. Not only was Jesus unwilling to sin, listen to this, he was unable to sin. He was unable to sin. That's what's so important about this. Let's look at Satan's final temptation and Jesus' response. I think it's just awesome and we need to look at it. Matthew 4, 8-11. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, All things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. In verse 10. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and Him alone you shall serve. Then the, level, the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. You see, the cross was coming. The cross was coming. The cross was ahead. And there was nothing that Satan could do to stop it. Even his manipulation of Judas wasn't enough. The, the manipulation and, the, and, the, and the, 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 the use of the Jewish leaders and the Roman governor would work to accomplish God's plan, not hinder it. They were all part of it. God used these evil intentions of these people to accomplish His purposes. That Jesus would die for the sins of the world. 
He would die as a sinless sacrifice. And victory over sin, death, and hell was a guarantee. That's what happened. That's what was going on here. That Satan was and is a defeated foe. Satan was and is a defeated foe. There is no struggle between God and the devil. I, 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 you know, I understand on Facebook, I understand maybe what people are trying to accomplish whenever they, they post these little images of, of, of like the devil and, and Jesus, and they're like arm wrestling, and they're like facing off. Like there's some type of a struggle. Like who's going to win? I, who's going to be stronger? How is this going to play out? It's done. It's done. There, there is no struggle. There's, battles are still being waged for the souls of men. But listen, the war is over. It's done. It's finished. The end of the book has been written. There is no struggle anymore. There is no fight that is still being fought. Satan was and is a defeated foe. You see, the name Satan, uh, you may not know or realize, is adversary. That's what it means. That's what that, that, it means, adversary. But according to the Bible, Jesus proved to be the greater adversary to the devil than the devil was to him. Amen? And Jesus is indeed the greater adversary. But this was the promise. This was the promise that, that, that God the Father made all the way back in Genesis 3 when He pronounced judgment on the serpent for His temptation of Eve. That Satan may harass and antagonize Jesus, but Jesus would destroy him. That's what we see. That was a promise. All the way back to Genesis 3, verses 14 and 15. It says, So the Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And verse 15 is the key. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Right? There's a great distinction there. A head wound is fatal, can be fatal, uh, fatal, right? A a, a heel wound is a minor annoyance. And I can say amen to that. I've been dealing with a a heel wound for quite some time in my running. It's not fatal. I'm not going to die from it. That's what's being said here. This was all planned. This was all God's plan. This is God keeping His promise to crush Satan's head. That this was all the plan. So what does this mean for you and me? What does this last couple of verses uh, mean for us? How can we apply this truth? That Christ's victory is our victory. If you've placed your faith in Jesus, Christ's victory is your victory. That Satan, sin, death, and hell were all defeated at the cross of Calvary. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we have an advocate before God the Father that is also the chief adversary of Satan. The chief adversary of Satan, that Satan is a defeated foe. And listen, listen close to this last part. The only part, the only power he has over you is the power that you allow him to have over you. The only power that Satan has over you is the power that you allow him to have over you. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says this, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. See, Mark's gospel identifies Jesus as the adversary of Satan. And so as we close out our time this morning, after all that you've seen and all that you've heard this morning, let me ask you the same question I began with. Who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to you? You see, nothing matters more in this life than how you see Jesus, how you respond to Jesus. You see, if you have not and do not see Him as the Son of God, you see Him wrongly. You say, well, you, can't, you don't have the right to say that. The, the Bible gives me the authority to say that. If you don't see Him as the Son of God, you reject Him as the Son of God, then you see Him wrongly. You see, Jesus wasn't just a good man. He wasn't just a good teacher. He wasn't just a good example for us to follow and to admire. That Jesus must be the Lord and Savior of your life or He isn't anything to you at all. He isn't anything to you at all. If He's not your Lord and your Savior, He is nothing to you. I invite you to see Him this morning for who He is, who He truly is, to see Him and receive Him as your Lord and Savior if you have not. And for my brothers and sisters in Christ this morning, I would just invite you to rejoice. 
to rejoice that Mark has reminded us today that Jesus is one of us. He is one of us, that He knows exactly what we are experiencing, what we are going through. That Jesus is the Son of God. He is the Son of God, that that we are to love Him and to worship Him and to obey Him and to submit our lives to Him fully. And that Jesus is the adversary of Satan. That He fights for us. And better yet, He has already won the war. Amen? He has already won the war. Let me pray for us and we'll have a time to respond. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the, the, the truth that we have heard today. God, that we, we have a clear, clear picture from Mark's gospel of who Jesus is. If we were to say that we don't believe this, or if we were to say, I am still not sure who Jesus is, it's only because we choose not to believe. We choose to, to ignore the, the clear evidence of the Scripture. So God, for For those here this morning that that would say that I just simply don't believe. I simply don't uh, believe the the Scriptures to be true. I don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I don't believe that Jesus is the the only way to be saved. God, I pray that you would just tear down those strongholds. God, I pray that you would give them a a, a believing spirit, that you would remove the scales from their eyes, that you would help them to know the truth, to receive the truth, to love the truth, that Jesus is indeed the Son of God that Jesus is indeed the the one and only way of salvation, that if they would repent of their sins and place their faith in Him, they could be forgiven and receive the gift of eternal life. God, for Your saints, for Your church, for the people of God, help us to rejoice that we have a Savior and a high priest that can identify with us in every way. Father, thank You for loving us. Thank You for thinking of us. Thank You for saving us. Thank you for giving us your son, Jesus Christ. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.